All right. So um, it's queuing you up, John. And today we have John Kalamakitis uh, with Cascadia Research, who uh, it, it's, it's quite the blessing to have you here. And we're very thankful that you've got the time to share um, some of your recent work. And um, we would love to uh, welcome you first to this little series of um, interviews that I'm doing. And you've been, um, you've been in this area for a number of years. You're actually from Olympia, um, and you, but you come down a lot because you have spent your life with Cascadia Research um, studying blue whales, humpback whales, gray whales, uh, and a variety of other animals that have come across your path. So um, this has been really, um, you're, you're wherever the whales are. And uh, we always hear, oh, John's in town, and we keep an eye out for you because we know that means that if John is here, so are the whales. So uh, we love sharing that with you. Anyway, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Yes, no, great. And, uh, and I am, I'm talking to you from Olympia, Washington. That's where Cascadia Research is based. We were going to this spring celebrate our 40th anniversary uh, because I helped found Cascadia in 1979. Uh, so this is actually our 41st year, but we have to postpone it uh, mm. due to uh, social distancing uh, restrictions. So, and uh, started studying humpback gray whales in the mid 1980s. So shortly after we started okay. Cascadia. So it has been a while that uh, I've been looking at them and our work actually with uh, humpback and blue whales started in California. So that's where we do a lot of it still. Gotcha. Well, so, um, Tell me, you, you, uh, the humpback whales, the gray whales, and the blue whales, which one do you want to start with? <laughs> well, you know, maybe gray whales. Uh, okay, because it's uh, this we'll season. We'll start with the, uh, you know, with the, uh, who I'm studying at the moment. Just okay, great. We do have some ongoing research right now with gray whales, and I'm doing field work and uh, involved in some disentanglement work with gray whales as well. Wonderful. Yes, I. You mentioned when we were getting ready to go live about a um, a disentanglement that you were involved in, and and you actually, um, Dave had the privilege of working with you down here on a disentanglement at one point as well. Um, so tell us about that. You um, you are someone who has been trained, vetted, and now you train people on how to do safe, successful whale disentanglements. Um, not everybody even knows what, 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 what is the deal with these whales getting entangled? What are they getting tangled up in? Right. And along the West Coast, that's become a, a, a growing concern since about 2015, because that's when we saw a major uptick in right. entanglements uh, in all types of whales along the U.S. West Coast, but especially in California. Uh, I had initially gotten involved in some disentanglement work and sort of got grandfathered into the more formal process, uh, you know, just because I've been doing it for a long time, but it's only become a more major focus even for me in more recent years as it's become a bigger problem and the encounters have become more frequent. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of that, I think, has been, you know, the expansion of certain types of fishing operations expanding into areas whales use. It's also been, you know, in some ways, a positive byproduct of the growing whale population. So there's more right. whales out there to get entangled. But I, th I think along with that growing, especially humpback whale population, they've also expanded more into new habitats themselves, which has caused a greater overlap uh, with some of the fishing activities, especially things like the Dungeness crab fishery that is primarily in more shallow waters. And as humpback whales have expanded their feeding areas, they've come more into those areas. So that combination of factors, changes in the fisheries, growing population, and expanding habitats, all played a role in, I think, why it became a bigger problem more recently. But I also think it was probably lurking a little bit as a problem all along. And I think improved reporting has also oh. maybe uh, you know, not increased the problem, but increased our knowledge. Awareness, uh, uh, right. Of it. 
uh, and especially in areas where there is regular whale watching, whether that's in the Southern California Bight where Dolphin Safari is based, you know, or Monterey Bay, a lot of entanglement reports tend to come as a result of reports of people on the water. And up in areas like Washington, where we don't have much whale watching that occurs off the outer coast of Washington, you know, we see an even more and still continued underreporting uh, yeah. of entanglements. And often if we get a report, we'll never hear from that whale uh, again, just right. because we have to either take advantage of it right then or get a tracking buoy on it because right. there's not enough reporting to keep track of. You, you do bring up a great point, and that is that um, awareness is part of it and reporting is part of it. I know that um, from personal experience, having been out on trips, so you know, you're seeing a whale come by and everyone's so excited and happy on the boat, but then to the trained eye, you think this whale is acting weird. Why is this whale snorkeling the way that it is? Why is it never fluking? And, and so you're staying with it. And then you notice, you know, just maybe something about the way that it 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 it, it handles itself, or just, uh, you know, it, it, the experienced eye, something's up. We we've got to get a GoPro in the water, maybe, or hey, let's get our drone up because we we use a drone on every trip for whale watching. So we're just in the interest of you know getting great photography. Um, just for, for fun, we're not using it as an assessment tool at that point, we're just putting it up in the air. And then from the air, you start to see, oh, this, there's something trailing here behind the whale that's actually seeming to prevent it from fluking or, oh, it looks like it's got a line through its mouth. And, um, and then, but you wouldn't know that if you were just your average person out there who sees a whale for the first time, you're not paying attention. So I do think that there is some uh, advantage having more experienced eyes out on the water um, mm -hmm. and then having such a great reporting system in place. You know, we, I think we've improved that tremendously over the years from our, the first time we ever saw an entangled humpback and we're like, what do we do? Who do we call? Who's going to come? Anybody going to come? And now it's just so much better. I think Noah's done a great job of, of really bringing the attention of the network to people and then coming down and doing training locally and using people like you and, and Ed Lyman. So, so tell us about your experience with this gray whale on Friday. Yeah, and this was last week. Um, a report came into the NOAA entanglement hotline. It was fielded by uh, you know, Doug Sandilands was SR3 who advised me and ironically or coincidentally, uh, I was actually already on route towing my boat to do a survey for gray whales uh, for the Sounders gray whales, which are these whales that feed in Puget Sound. Uh, and so I was actually in an excellent position to just reroute to a different location. This whale was in the Strait of Juan de Fuca off Port Angeles. We were really fortunate in that weather was good uh, the reporting party, which was with Washington Department of Natural Resources, was willing to stand by the whale and, in fact, even had help from Washington That's Department right. of Fish and Wildlife. So we knew they would be willing to stay with the whale if we could get there in time. We were operating. I was about to do the my survey solo, partly because we're operating under you know restrictions related to the coronavirus here in the state. Um, and so generally I'm operating solo now, something I used to do a long time ago uh, and do still periodically now. So I, I get pretty used to, you know, driving, photographing, taking data, even collecting samples. Uh, but, but it's not something you can try to disentangle a whale. <laughs> right, uh, right. With. So I was able to uh, get one of our uh, other researchers, uh, Kirsten Flynn, uh, who is also trained uh, disentangler to come and join me and we were able to get out to this whale. And it turned out to be a gray whale, uh, still free swimming, uh, tangled in Washington State Dungeness crab gear. Mm -hmm. uh, and it had gear, it had rope through its mouth. Uh, and then uh, it went kind of over the back and over a peck fin and the trailing gear and the uh, uh, you know, the pot was still hanging down below the whale and it wasn't trailing much gear. In fact, nothing much extended beyond the flukes of the whale. Mm. So we were also fortunate that it was a whale that uh, was swimming fairly slowly. We were able to approach 
uh, initially, our anticipation was we were going to primarily engage in what is a really important part of the response, which, which is just to document what Assess, type yeah. of gear, how the whales entangled, even if that's the only part you can do that's often really worthwhile and important. And we weren't sure given we didn't have the ideal equipment and setting and personnel we would have normally wanted. But once we assessed this whale, uh, you know, with above water photographs and some underwater footage with a GoPro, uh, we also had a, a news helicopter circling live streaming uh, video. And so I kind of felt like we had a virtual third person in the boat because right. we had Doug on shore who I had on, you know, speakerphone, who was able to be assessing from the video that was constantly <laughs> feeding from the helicopter. Right, right. So it was actually uh, almost like a virtual third person in the boat, which really helped. Uh, and we realized uh, that it was a situation where we could try to engage safely in a disentanglement. Uh, effort. So we did attach some uh, a tracking, a satellite tracking buoy initially in case we lost the whale or it didn't respond well to our next effort. So now we had it in a way that we could track it and stay with it. Uh, we then determined we could make a fairly simple cut uh, of the line that came out of the mouth and over the back and the whale was being cooperative enough that we could maneuver and make that wow. cut fairly wow. easily. Wow. And with that cut, that dropped away the descending pot. Uh, still now the line went through the mouth and went to the trailing gear uh, and the tracking buoy we had added. And then after assessing that, we were able to determine that if we could just put pressure on the gear because there were no wraps around Wonderful. the pack fin, we could just pull it out of the mouth of the whale. Uh, and there didn't like seem a to piece be of dental out. floss. That's right. Right. Uh, so we were able to, you know, re-grapple the gear and gently pull on it uh, and remove it and totally free the whale and then follow it for several more hours uh, wow. uh, afterward to make sure it was in good condition and make sure we had good photographs and we even collected a, a small skin sample at that. Oh, wonderful. So John, what, what are your, you said it was um, a Washington uh, crab pot gear. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming that comes from the tag because all uh, all fishermen have to tag each of their pots, right? So that's helpful, you know, where it's coming from. Um, would you say that it, or do you know, was that recently placed? So this whale has not been entangled very long. Was it, do you? Yeah, we don't have, I don't know the timing yet. So I can't quite answer that. Uh, and I'm just going to see if I can I don't know if it's worth, uh, I was going to see if there's an easy way to just show you a couple of photographs. Sure, of the we'd year. love it. Yeah. Uh, but that's, uh, so just so you know, I'm going to my website and calling up, uh, uh, you know, our, and if you go to cascadiaresearch.org, uh, yeah. we do have, uh, Wonderful. we do have a little story up on that. Awesome. Uh, we will put a link to uh, Cascadia below. Um, the uh, the video today yeah. and I don't know if now you can see yes my screen and and this is our story from our website and uh, showing you know the way fabulous yeah some of these images that we're showing are not always images you know we would show but some of these are actually from the uh, the news helicopter that already oh okay these. gotcha this is some of the underwater footage we have showing the entanglement and how the line went over and the descending line to the pot. And then after we made the initial cup that dropped that pot away and left only the trailing gear. And then, you know, this shows us grappling, basically grappling the gear, uh, which now includes our tracking buoy. So it made it easy to pull that line in and then finally the whale completely free. So we right. were able to have kind of good success. That's with that. so awesome, you know, um, disentanglements are difficult and we appreciate the work that and and the risk i mean you obviously you try to minimize risk you never know whether a whale is going to be receptive or not so we appreciate the work that you do and putting yourself out there in the line of um fire if you will uh you how many whales have you been involved in disentangling over the years well, you know, it, it, it happened fairly infrequently earlier. So I think it's up, to, it's around a dozen. I should add them up and, and, and see, but some, you know, in the earlier years, spaced, you know, multiple years apart and only right. more frequently in, in recent years. Uh, so it's not a large number. 
compared to you know some of the other yeah. more experienced people, especially where they've worked on the East Coast, people like Doug Sandilands or Jen Tackaberry that are other level four disentanglers here on the West Coast that uh, worked on the East Coast where they have a much more long standing funded program and a, a literal a crew standing by to do disentanglements you know, all the time, whereas here it, we're doing it more, you know, opportunistically. Right, right. Well, thank you. And that's, I'm sure, a much happier uh, animal as it heads north. Um, yeah, so tell was, us. When we left it, it was, uh, it was nice to see it back behaving very normally, uh, you know, like a typical gray whale. And it was, uh, we did not recognize it. You know, we do these intensive studies of, uh, the gray whales that feed in the Pacific Northwest. And, and there are two primary groups who, uh, that we study, the Pacific Coast Feeding Group, uh, which is the group of whales that feeds in spring, summer, and fall from Northern California up through British Columbia. Uh, and there are about 250 of those animals that we track. We know almost all of them by photo ID. Um, and then there are these sounders gray whales that come into Puget Sound, which ironically largely are separate from the PCFG whales because they're mostly gray whales that stop en route to their feeding grounds in the Arctic. Uh, and so they'll feed generally from late February through May wow. in Puget Sound. And you wouldn't think that would be stable, but the area we study them is almost 150 miles off their migratory pathway. And it looks like these were whales that discovered this area and now return every year. So we have seen the same whales for over wow. 30 years. Wow, <laughs> uh, that's amazing. And, and they've done really well. That's amazing. I, 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 I wonder, you know, I'm just a layman. I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, I'm not educated in this, but I wonder, so how does it start? You know, you've got the first whale or two who come together and like, hey, you know, why wait till we get up further north? Why, you know, let's have a snack now. Let's stay here. Hey, there's food. Let's build up our reserves again. Let's start, you know, getting some food. This is great. And then do they get up to the Chuck Chi Sea and the other animals are up there and they're like, where have you been? You know, we've been up here for a couple of months. Oh, we stopped, you know, over here. It was great. And then it, and then that, this is my active imagination, you know, is and then how do they communicate to each other? Do they bring them? Do they, do they, do they describe, well, you take a left at this, you know, how does that all work? So that yeah. now you're up to 12 yeah. of these animals coming to the same place. It's fascinating. Yeah. And I can show you uh, uh, what looks like how that developed. Oh, uh, I would love that. Okay. Let, let me, let me uh, uh, share my screen again here. And because I love the story. I love um, understanding the individual and then the group mentality. You know, I think it's fascinating. Okay. Are you seeing a chart? I am, yes. Okay. So this is the uh, number of gray whale strandings. That so we right now, I'm sorry, excuse me. I see your whole screen. I see all the screenshots. Which one do you want us to be looking at? Okay. Okay. Let me, let, let me re redo this again here okay. and, uh, and get you hopefully zoomed in mm -hmm. on the correct slide. Okay. How about now? Do you see a chart? Perfect. Up? Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Had to do that correctly. Um, so this is number of strandings of gray whales in well, Washington. Well, actually, I'm so sorry. I'm checking on my YouTube feed. Oh, there it is. Okay. It's up now. Great. Okay. Uh, and so this shows the annual number of strandings in Washington state. And, and wow. along the x-axis here is year. And you'll see a couple of things. First of all, you'll see this twin peak up here in 1999, 2000. Yeah. And this is when, you know, between those two years, we had 50 gray whales wash up dead in Washington state. They rec represented prior to last year, a record number of strandings uh, of gray whales that we had in Washington state. And those two years were declared the first uh, gray whale unusual mortality event. And now you'll see the spike all the way for the right. And, I, and you can tell me, are you seeing my cursor? Yes. Okay. So we had 34 strandings last year in Washington state and up and down the coast, there were more than 200 strandings, but just in Washington state, we had 34. And that's what resulted in this second unusual mortality event being declared uh, for gray whales. Now, along with these peaks and these years where we had peak numbers, whether it was 1999, 2000, 
2019, or we saw this in 1991, right. these represented years that a lot of these gray whales that were dying were really emaciated and thin. And not only did we see dead whales washing up, we saw more very thin gray whales wandering around in unusual areas. And what looked like was happening was the gray whales had not gotten enough to eat the previous year. And so here they were on their northern migration in spring after having fasted three or four months right. and they were running out of their reserves and now not quite able to complete the migration to the Arctic. And so you could almost think of it as a desperate search for new areas to feed because they weren't going to make it. And you know, for me, I was trying to think the, gray, the Sounders gray whales represent this group of gray whales that uh, you know, discovered this highly, very risky feeding strategy. They actually feed on dense ghost shrimp beds that are only accessible at high tide. And these beds are actually totally out of the water and exposed and high and dry at low tide. So the whales are feeding in intertidal waters that if they get the timing wrong, they're going to strand. Wow. Uh, so I was thinking, okay, how did they know to come way off this migration? How did they develop this incredibly risky strategy of feeding? Right. And, uh, and now I'm going to jump to, uh, let me jump to uh, another figure here. And who went first? You know, who said, I'm going to try this? Yeah. Well, and I think I know who went first. Oh, okay. That's going to be part of my story. All right. I can't wait. Okay. <laughs> well, first we put this together. So here's that same figure I showed you on top here. Uh, but below it is, in red, is a graph showing when did new sounder whales start wow. using that area. And you'll notice that uh, Same year. In that wow. 99, 2000, that's when six of the sounders discovered that area. Wow. And the original six occurred in 1990, 91, which you'll see is yep. the second highest peak for strandings. And again, was another one. That's that amazing. Occurred. What a story. <laughs> yeah. What a story. So it kind of made sense. And then we looked at who were the original whales. And, and this actually came out of, uh, let me actually... Uh, I might, uh, let's see if I can go to some video here. I'm going to jump to some uh, video and I'll just show you. These are from some suction cup attached video tags that we put on these Sounders whales a few years ago. And in particular, we put this multi-sensor video tag you see in the upper right. Yeah. Uh, that has dual cameras uh, and uh, also records 12 different sensors. We get this high resolution data on the whales. And the very first whale we deployed it on was one of those first whales that we found using this whale, using this area and this feeding strategy. And now we should be looking at the video yeah. from that whale. And this is from the very first deployment we did. And the first thing that we noticed is there was all these interactions occurring between the whales. Like right there, that was where the tag we deployed on the whale got turned around. It was facing forward and it got turned around to face backwards. <laughs> wow. And so now the video on the left you see is facing backwards. Wow. This whale is what we consider one of our first pioneer whales. She's still the one that feeds furthest inshore, farthest from deep water, was first seen in 1999. We've given her the name Earhart because she's one of our few females. I love it. And we think she's one of the pioneers. And here she is actually headed into the shallows to feed. And wow. by virtue of this tag facing backwards, you're going to notice that coming into coming view behind. are actually three other gray whales that are following her into the shallows. Wow. And that's amazing. So here's what, you know, one of the whales is the whale that turned the tag around. And that's yep. what you see in that right yep. there. And now you'll see other, two other whales coming into view. Wow. Or into the shallows. So all three, and all three of these whales are males. <laughs> that are following <laughs> I her. love it. And once they get into the shallows, they separate and start feeding. But suddenly it became clear that, you know, our very first whales that were yep. documented doing this you know, the other whales actually physically follow them in. 
and yes. I think have learned this behavior. And so, wow. we, so we've named the first two whales, uh, uh, the female Earhart and a male that was with her, Shackleton. I love it. Pioneer. Yep. And I think they're the ones that pioneered this feeding strategy. Wow. I don't think they communicate it to other whales because the whales that we found adopting this have been other whales that showed up in this area and then followed them right into the shop. Followed them in, got it. And, it. and it seems like, again, in 2019, we've seen some new whales show up and, and do this feeding. Wow. Uh, and how it, many, I'm sorry, how many whales have you observed feeding simultaneously in the same area besides these four? Yes. Well, you know, we'll get the, the sounders number about 12 whales and they'll be not in the same area, but we'll have them all feeding at high tide. And in fact, if I'll show you a little bit more tag footage, if you want. Yes, uh, I love it. Here, like for one thing, I'll show that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the contact between whales didn't always work against us. Like for example, and let me, uh, let me see if I can control this a little bit better because, okay. Now you're seeing a whale that's about uh, with a tag on it that's facing backwards. So that right image is facing backwards. Okay. Uh, and you can see the tag is kind of loose. It's just attached with yeah, suction it's cups. Kinda, it's, right. It's hanging on by one suction cup. And this ends up being one of our longer tag deployments because now here come two whales rubbing up against it again. Wow. <laughs> and I love see, it. There they rub against it. And you'll see in a second, they'll make contact with the tag, but this time, they'll actually turn the tag around <laughs> to be facing forward, which is exactly the image we want. But along with doing that, it occurs right there. That's right. You'll also notice now the tag is no longer shaking. Wow, and, they and reattached it, it. They pressed it back on. This tag stayed on 67 hours. Wow. <laughs> on the whale, which is really long for a suction cup tag. Because oh my goodness. Getting pressed back on by the whales uh, doing this. I just love seeing that body to body contact. And then just so I'm clear, to, you, you, you said that these ghost shrimp, right? Ghost shrimp yes. are, in, are on these beds that are generally covered at high tide. So by how high is the tide there in the sound? Yes, we do have you know, almost 15 foot tides. Okay. And, but the whales are typically feeding in eight to 10 feet of water. Uh, wow which means often parts of you know, their pectoral fins or part of their flukes or part of their body will actually be exposed Wow! while they're feeding. And, and some of the tag data, like for example, this is the really detailed sensor data. And in red down here, each of these plateaus actually represents a whale you know, excavating one of these feeding pits and feeding. So it gave us really precise data on how often the whales were feeding. Uh, and, and these you'll, are six and you'll see how, the tide. Yeah, and you'll see how quickly, here's a whale diving, and right here, it's immediately on the bottom. <laughs> yeah, And, and wow. here, these little holes you see are the, the, the filtering holes of ghost shrimp. And now the whale shrimp. has its right side of its head on the bottom, and it's kind of Just sitting scooping it up. And now it's actually engaging in this pulsive sucking action which you'll see will start to create this plume of mud that you see yeah. forming. Uh, and now you'll see streaming by the whale. And you'll even see a ghost shrimp go by here that got away. Oh, right I now. saw that. Right, 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 right. That's yeah. great. You know, but this wow. whale, part of its body is actually above the surface while it's engaged in this. So you're talking about a 15 foot tide. You're talking about an animal that, you know, if it were laying on the floor next to me, might be six, seven, Yep. feet high. So it doesn't have a lot of leeway. What do you, do you, have you observed? I'm just fascinated by this. I didn't mean to spend so much time on it, but I, I just love the, um, seeing the personality, the thought process of the whale really come through here. Yeah. Um, do you see the same kind of exit behavior? You know, does Earhart say, okay, I, I, I feel like the tide's getting low guys, you know, come on boys, let's go and yeah. she signals the exit or does everybody kind of, have you it, observed anything about that? It seems like they leave separately because they're, okay. se they become separated as they feed. So it seems like they've, the main place we've seen them follow the lead has been on when to go on. 
And this is a piece of our tag data here spanning a 37 hour period. So time 37 hours along the X axis here. Yep. This is diving behavior. These short dives you see here, 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 and here are all where the whale is feeding and it's feeding only in about eight to 10 feet of water. That's as deep as these are diving. And superimposed is the tidal cycle here. That's Love this it. orange line. And you'll see that they're only feeding primarily on the rising you know, side of the high tide. And then once the tide starts decreasing, they stop and leave. They're out. They're like, okay. And you can see they just have these short periods. In this yep. case, is four short periods. How many hours does that represent? Is that you know, it ends up you know really representing you know periods of generally you know three to four hours. Gotcha. Uh, depending so, on how high a high tide it is, these were pretty high high tides in this case that they were feeding on. But uh, gotcha. Uh, so so John, let me just say for kids who are watching, this is why you pay attention during math class when they're <laughs> when they're studying graphs or during science class when they're studying graphs or statistics so that if you want to study animals like this or a lot of other things um you'll be able to 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 understand graphs right yeah yeah that's great thank you john that is fascinating i love that <laughs> wow i want to come up and see that behavior that is amazing um, okay, so you're a busy guy. Um, tell us what else is going on. You've got humpbacks that you're studying and blue whales. What do you want to yeah. cover next? No, absolutely. And, and humpbacks, we track the population. You know, most of our work and the longest standing part of our work has been this long-term photo ID. And for me, part of the exciting part of my research is there are pieces of my research, like the tracking and photo ID that we've done for 30 years. Uh, and it represents more the value of using, you know, a method that's been around for a while and you learn more and more, you know, and right. I could show a table, but basically for both blue whales, humpback whales and gray whales, we have thousands of individuals, sometimes 5,000 in the case of humpback whales, different individuals wow. we've uniquely identified by their natural markings. And, and in the case of humpbacks, over 50,000 records of encounters of those individuals going back through this 30 wow. year period. What a contribution. That's yeah, amazing. that's the that's one exciting piece. And then the other exciting piece is getting to uh, participate and be a part of using some of these new technologies like the tags, right. you know, that have opened up the world of, you know, of whales. For me, yeah. it was studying whales for 20 years, just wondering about what their what lives were like underwater. Right. Right. And then all of a sudden having a tool that's opening up that world. And these tags are really superior in terms of not being invasive. Um, it's a fairly short period of time that they're tagged. There's not, obviously, when you see when you see the tags sliding around on the whale or turning around or coming off and coming back on, you know, it's, it's not a bother to the whale at all. And the amount of great information you're able to pull is fantastic. So um, kudos to, are, to the yeah. folks who create those. And there are many different types of tags. So when you hear reports or stories on whale tagging, keep in mind that there are many variations. You know, generally the tags fall into two classes. One are the more short-term tags that we predominantly use that we call archival tags, meaning all the data is being recorded on the tag and you have to recover the tag. I see. So it kind of puts you, yeah. you, you can get, you know, in the case of like that, that video I showed you, in addition to the video, those 12 sensors were recording data sometimes 400 times a second they were taking a reading wow. because wow. memory is easy to store huge amounts of data. So you're getting 12 it's sensors fabulous, and yeah. you know, hundreds of data points a second versus what are called satellite tags that have to transmit their data to satellites. Those tend to be the tags where the emphasis is on longer term deployments. And that's where sometimes more invasive attachment mm. techniques are used to achieve those longer durations of deployment. So those will sometimes be implanted into the muscle or blubber layer you know, of the whale so that it can stay on and record for a year. Uh, so you have that trade-off, not only in terms of the invasiveness and potential impact on the animal, but then the data you're getting uh, is much more limited 
it can only be the very brief transmissions the tag can make while the whale is at the surface and a satellite is in view. And you know, historically that has meant maybe a few very crude positions a day, you know, right, and right. now there are ways to try to add a few more, you know, try to get a more accurate position or get some kind of summary of its dive behavior, but you'd never approach the detail of data or the GPS quality positions, uh, you know, we're getting on a routine basis from our shorter term tag. Right. And then there are things in between. I should point out that in addition to the suction cup, deploy tags, we have used some tags where we'll attach them with short darts. So they won't go very deep, but they'll give us up to a three or four week deployment on a okay. blue whale. We still have to recover the tag. It still pulls out. Uh, it's still a lower, less invasive tag than the implant satellite tags, but it's certainly more invasive than the suction cup. Uh, right. And so we'll use that in cases where that longer term data is particularly critical, but we still are looking for that high resolution data. So here in um, Dana Point, the Dana Point area, Orange County, um, we saw, you know, I want to say like in 2002, we saw a humpback whale three times and it was headline news. You know, Dave was on ABC7. Uh, you know, it was the really big deal to see one humpback. And um, now we've had years where we've seen 250, 300 uh, in, in encounters. Now, I don't want to say individuals, but encounters. And the same animal hangs around and feeds, and it's just such a treat. Yes. So, I mean, the humpback whales last summer were off the charts. And um, so these humpbacks, uh, my understanding, and please verify, is that these humpbacks are the ones who are not not our Hawaiian friends. These are the ones who winter down in uh, Baja, right? And then they come back up the coast and they're feeding here. Can you tell us more about that? Absolutely. And, and the very pattern that you're describing is exactly what's occurred up and down the coast. Okay. Not just with uh, Southern California. whales extending their range and feeding range into Southern California, but up into inside waters of the Salish Sea, we've seen a dramatic expansion up here, but that's also part of the pattern we believe that has occurred that has increased entanglements in terms of that expanded habitat. Right. Some of that's been the result of, you know, the, the larger humpback whale population. Some of it has been involved and there was a paper I was a co-author on that talked about some of the compression of feeding habitat that's been a result you know, of some of the changes in mm -hmm. oceanographic conditions have concentrated sometimes whales in more coastal areas. And some of it's also a result of the fact humpback whales can feed on krill or fish. And, and fish, feed right. On krill, they're often closer to the shelf edge, but when they feed on fish, it brings them more into closer waters where yeah. spring anchovy are often more abundant. So it's a little bit of a complicated pattern involving expanded gray whale uh, humpback populations prey switching and this compressed habitat that have caused this kind of expansion into new areas and some of the added uh, overlap with fishing activities. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and if you want, uh, I can show you just a little bit of that trend and what's that look like if people don't yeah. mind us, us bouncing back and forth and we'll see how quickly I can uh, get to some, yeah, uh, no some problem. of the other relevant data. If I can while, you're, while you're pulling that up, I, I'm curious, um, have you have what would you say the overall health status is of humpback whales compared to the, the gray whales um, or even um, um, blue whales who have been getting reported as being thinner or even emaciated um, yeah. these last well, year or two? Humpback populations off the west coast have done well, and I and what I'm showing right now is a trend. Uh, going back to the late 1980s of humpback whales off California and Oregon. And you'll see that steady increase. When I started studying humpbacks in the mid 1980s, we estimated fewer than 500 humpback whales were feeding uh, off of California and Oregon. And now our estimates are in excess of 3,000, 3 to 5,000 are our estimates. So wow. we've almost seen, you know, a five to tenfold increase in estimated humpback abundance. 
Uh, and some of that in our, in our broader studies of humpback whale movements that we did in the splash study a number of years ago, you know, showed that humpback whales were increasing throughout the North Pacific through the mid 2000s. But the story in more recent years has become more complicated up in areas like Southeast Alaska, you know, they've reported a dramatic decrease in humpback huh. whale occurrence in recent years. Uh, and that's been the subject of some concern. Right now, it's not as clear whether that's an actual abundance change or a distribution. Right, redistribution, that. yeah. But our populations here on the West Coast have continued to grow right. uh, and continue. This trajectory overall comes out to about 7 to 8% per year, averaged over this entire period. That's and, it, and it's impressive that you know over a 30-year period, that then turns into this 5 to 10-fold uh, increase in numbers. So they've done extremely well. You know, there was a time when I, I mean, it was a dream of mine. I would study um, the uh, Alaskan humpback um, behaviors and look for when they would be feeding at, at the best time of, of the summer, you know, and when, I, when we could go and watch them bubble net feeding, you know, we, I, I desperately wanted to see that. It was on my bucket list of things to do. And then lo and behold, right here off data point we have two or three humpbacks one day and you know what are they doing they're bubble netting and they're just they're exhibiting the very behavior that i was going to you know we were going to go to alaska to see so it was a dream come true right here in our own backyard and i, I believe me i would love especially after six weeks of not being able to get out there to see eight seven to eight percent more humpbacks this summer Oh, that would make my heart so happy. That would just be amazing. We, we, we could really use that kind of, of engagement this year. I'll be curious on your observation on humpback whales. We've, we have never observed uh, West Coast humpback whales actually bubble net feeding. We've seen okay. them do bubble lines and bubble clouds, but never actually engage in the circular nets like right. in Southeast Alaska and other areas. And, and we think they just haven't quite you know, picked up on that or the prey here, you know, it's different. Uh, don't, yeah, that it hasn't yeah. made that advantageous. So, so you're very, you're a scientist. So you're, I, you know, you're very careful with your language. So let me just say bubbles were involved. Okay. Good. That, and that, <laughs> I'm and not going to, I'm not going to make a statement <laughs> about, you know, just like when you were, you and I were chatting uh, before uh, Michael Fishbach uh, came on to do his, uh, interview and I was telling you that he was excited because he saw a gray whale uh, a gray whale feeding in the Sea of Cortez and you said well I would say he's exhibiting feeding behaviors but we don't know if he was actually feeding so I, I tip my head and I say I defer to your choice of language and because uh, you're a scientist and you want to be really careful about what you infer with your words. So I respect that. And I'll just say bubbles were involved. Okay. So yeah, I'll let you know if we exhibit it, if we see anything different. Yeah. So I, we'll see what's happening with the humpbacks. I was going to share a couple of slides on the yes, sound of gray whales that yes. uh, I know we've ended up spending more time on gray whales than intended. And we can just maybe touch briefly on maybe uh, blue whales and okay. finish out the species though. That'd be great. Gray whales seem to have stolen the show today. Uh, I was just gonna point out one of the uh, studies we're excited about is a partnership we're doing with John Durbin and Holly Fernbaugh related to the Sounders gray whales and represents another of those cases where, you know, it gets me excited as a scientist. Here are these Sounders gray whales. I've been studying them for 30 years. Uh, and, you know, a few years ago got this new insight of using tags and now this year, you know, starting to work with John and Holly, you know, looking at some new capabilities using drone-based, uh, you know, health assessments that they do. They've done long-term studies of the Southern resident killer whales using these precision drone photographs to look at body condition. And that's something we're doing with the Sounders gray whales. And again, there's a post both on our and SR3's website uh, but one of the surprising things to us is this is just data from this year. And here is one of the whales, a whale we call Lucifer, photographed from the air three different times while it's feeding in these ghost shrimp beds. 
Wow. And one thing you'll notice that just across a few week time period, this whale has gone from looking pretty skinny to more robust yeah. to even more robust. That's and here awesome. you'll actually see there's some mud being uh, kind of squeezed out of its mouth. It's actually right. just engaged in feeding here. Uh, oh, I love that. And we were surprised that we would actually see these dramatic differences just from a few weeks yeah, apart. Yeah, four, four weeks. So yep. That's amazing. And here's two other individuals here. This is a whale we call wow. Patch. Again, yep. clearly girthier. Uh, and another individual here. Oh, I love Shackleton it. down here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, he knows his so, stuff. You know, and so along with to finish that story I had about how, do, how why do these whales, you know, come off the migration and feed? How did they learn to do this? Uh, this answers the question, why do they keep returning? Yeah. This is an incredibly rich and successful strategy for them that if they right. know how to exploit it, they're doing it really effectively. And you said that's been taking place for how many years? Over 30 years. Over 30 years. was the first year we documented it. And I've been talking to old time residents and getting a little bit of a mixed picture uh, uh -huh. of whether it occurred before, because it's a little hard to sort out People say, well, yes, we used to occasionally see gray whales. Uh, it's just been hard to find out where there are gray whales right. eating in the ghost shrimp beds. Prior. Because you weren't there to record it, so you wouldn't you wouldn't know. Yeah, right. So that's right. what we're sort of trying yeah. to figure out. Well, it nothing makes me happier than seeing a fat whale. I just love, I mean, you know, <laughs> that just makes me very happy. It's knowing that they get enough food. So, okay. So uh, what Blue whales. We're almost what? out of time, right? Oh, oh maybe I'm going to show this too. Okay. okay. This is uh, the same kind of video tag, except from Monterey Bay and, and a deployment we did there. And let me see, I have to succeed. In... Yeah, put, putting this tag on, wow. Yes. So what a here thrill. you're catching kind of dual images. Uh, the front image is from James Fallbush, who's in front of the boat there. Yep. The back image is me driving the boat. This is in Monterey Bay, and we're maneuvering into this dense group of anchovy feeding gray uh, humpback whales. Oh my gosh. And we're trying to just kind of come to the back of the group. We've zeroed in now on one whale at the back of the group. You'll see there's seabirds and sea lions. Crazy. In, in all feeding in this yeah. area. And here's our gray whale. Wow. Uh, here's our humpback. Look at that. Look at that. Oh. There's the tag going on. Nice. And now I'm going to switch to a rear and a, a, a front facing view from the tag on top and a rear face. I mean, a front facing view on the left and a rear facing view on the right of this split screen. Love it. Wow. And, and you'll see the body undulations as the whale swims. You'll see sea lions outlined that are following me. Yeah. Other whales outlined. Wow. And then you'll see this whale will actually turn and it's going to maneuver towards an anchovy school. So right now it's not fluking, but now here's an anchovy school coming in view. In okay. The, in the left wow. Side. Look at that. The whale accelerating into the anchovy. Look school. at that. Oh, wow. And you'll see it kind of breaks up the anchovy school and you'll see all the sea lions and even seabirds picking off here. It collides with another whale <laughs> that's trying to take advantage of this. Oh my gosh. Uh, but now you'll see some of the seabirds picking off the whales, the the anchovies that have gotten broken up. This this is incredible. <laughs> I th I don't know what it astounds me more. I love seeing the way birds swim underwater. Right, that yeah. blows my mind. But seeing this animal, just seeing that super thick bait ball, yeah. it's wow. That's incredible. And I these love whales, it. These whales in Monterey Bay don't quite have that coordination worked out that the Southeast Alaska humpback. Interesting. Whales have. Yep. So it's a little more chaotic. Uh, yep. Which was one of the fascinating things for us. And in fact, we were surprised how many times this whale tried to maneuver and feed and actually had to abort its feeding lunge because mm. another whale beat it to it. Beat it to you'll it. You'll actually see it. There's a dead anchovy floating by. Yeah. Uh, that you'll see go in the image. But here it is. It's going about to approach the anchovy school again, but oh, no, it has to maneuver below ah. this whale and it actually vocalizes there. Ah. It isn't able to get to the anchovy school in that case. And here it is trying to approach it again. And there's an anchovy school on the left there and that whale is- Oh, it to and it. that whale's got it. Okay. Wow. Can't go, we can't go there. Got to turn around again and find again. And finally it's going to succeed. Oh, here's my chance. 
and it gets by this whale and that's the end wow. oh, right there it's going to go into again oh i love it <laughs> and so, wow and, just and you so can you, see yeah go ahead this is the first two minutes unedited of our multi-hour video we there's no edit here this is just the first wow. two minutes of that tag <laughs> and it kind of blew us away when we when we had it so i can see why that was awesome john thank you so much for sharing that, that now is any of that on your website yes if on our website there's a link to our youtube channel okay and some of these videos both with gray whales and humpback whales uh, if you go to our youtube channel you'll see them on there oh that's awesome select some yeah of <laughs> Being able to be underwater with these animals is such a gift and to see what to, to, to really almost be in their skin yes. and to see this is what it's like, you know, for, uh, uh, you know, you think your day's rough, you know, you're, you're all booming people out of the way when you're trying to find toilet paper. Well, guess what? <laughs> you know, these guys, um, you know, these guys are really, they're, they're having to make their way and yes. and uh, you know and that's thankfully the there's an abundance of food up there these tags give us an incredible yeah. rich set of data but the part you're describing there of also the degree to which it gives you this more much Inside. more visceral sense of yeah. what their lives are like uh is also to me you know incredibly powerful and when i've shown it to people uh, has I get chills people. Yes. Yeah, I really do. I really get chills. I suddenly feel as though I'm, I'm in the skin of the animal and, um, you know, that's probably why you do what you do. So, um, I want to talk about blue whales because we're, we're waiting with bated breath, you know, will we see the blue whale soon? I mean, they, they're probably out there, but because we're not out there, we don't know. Um, uh, you know, how thick will they be this summer? You know, we've had years where we've had almost a thousand encounters and then it's dropped, you know, down to 75 and then go back up to two or 300. So um, tell us a little bit about blue whales. Right. Well, blue whales, it's sort of interesting. Unlike that upward population trend I showed with humpback whales, uh, blue whale, our estimates going back again, 30 years have been fairly stable. Uh, and have showed somewhere in the 1,500 to 2,000 blue whales using the U.S. West Coast as a feeding area. And, but the interesting part is the proportion of those animals and how much time they spend and where they're feeding varies quite a bit year to year. So we think the population has been pretty steady, has not been growing, but we think how they're distributed and where they go to feed varies widely year to year. And that can create these huge spikes in sightings in one area, whether it be Monterey Bay or the Farallones or in your area in the Southern California Bight, uh, that can vary pretty widely year to year. And uh, our tracking these blue whales with photo ID have shown that they do travel huge distances. Right. Uh, and some years they're going up into the Gulf of Alaska, the same individuals we see off California to feed. You know, humpback whales, you know, it's interesting. There's variation in you know, abundance and type of prey. And you can see humpback whales tend to be pretty loyal to certain areas. Mm -hmm. And they'll adapt by the habitat they're feeding in and which prey they're feeding in. You know, but they'll still stay in the same general region. Blue whales are more exclusive krill feeders and they adapt by moving to new areas. Mm -hmm. So a blue whale one year might go to the coast of California and feed, but if it's not finding very productive ground, it might move, move that back down to the west coast of Baja, or it might move up off British Columbia or up into the Gulf of Alaska. Right. Feed. And that can create pretty big fluctuations in how many whales are using the California coast and especially specific smaller areas within them. Yeah. But we think blue whales overall have been steady, but our big concern there has been that there's been this big increase in number of ship strikes of blue whales that's occurred. Mm -hmm. You know, we became alerted to this, uh, you know, with this, you know, spike in uh, ship strikes that occurred in the late 2000s. And so the last 10 years, we've been trying to uh, document this. And we still think it's having a major effect. A, a paper we published just a year ago estimated that the number of blue whales being killed by ship strikes alone, outside of any other cause, exceeded that safe level that NOAA identifies something called a PBR, 
It's the estimate of how many animals before you might start affecting the population could be killed. Our mm -hmm. estimates of ship strikes were dramatically exceeding that PBR. So we are very concerned about the impact of ship strikes on whales and it, you know, entanglements with humpback whales. That's one of our main conservation concerns with blue whales. The risk of ship strikes is one of our big conservation concerns and why a lot of our research in the last five years has focused on areas where there is overlap between ships and whales. And even our tag deployments have been to try to document how are they using those areas. We published a paper last fall showing blue whales were far over twice as vulnerable to ship strikes at night mm. than the day because wow. they were spending twice as much time resting near the surface oh. uh, at night than in the day. So it doubled their risk of a, uh, being hit by a ship, which really heightened our focus on, you know, obviously having ships try to spot whales to avoid them is not gonna be able to address that particular right. uh, risk factor. Uh, we've also been looking at uh, understanding why are blue whales so vulnerable? And we documented and published a paper last fall as well of a case study where we actually were following and had tagged a blue whale that we think came within tens of meters of being hit by a ship. Uh, we had to get out of the ship's way and the tag showed that the whale was actually coming up from a deeper dive and fortunately hesitated before it surfaced and the ship passed over it before it surfaced, but it still wow. came within tens of meters of being hit by that whale. And that whale never changed its course. And it's something we've seen in our other cases that the whales seem to only be aware of it as a danger when the ship is really close and really loud. And even then they don't seem to alter their course. At best, mm. they alter their dive behavior. And that's why they're so vulnerable to these ship strikes. Right, have they done any research on um, what it would look like if ships emitted some sort of a, a sound or yes. pinging or something? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's kind of been explored. Uh, it was explored, you know, a number of years ago on the East Coast with right whales because right. That's other species, yeah. uh, especially in the Atlantic, that there's been a great deal of concern about ship strike impact. And the very first studies were actually using some of the tags like we use on whales and then playing back different sounds to the whales to see how it changed their behavior. Uh, and unfortunately, it was found when different types of sound and especially alarm type sounds were played, at least for right whales, they reacted by coming to the surface and spending more time at the surface, the very opposite of what you, of want. What you want. Yeah. So, so that's why, you know, we began to realize, well, it, it looks like, you know, we shouldn't make assumptions that just because they can hear the ship better, that means they're going to react the right. right way or react right. at all. And, and while that's not an, a closed area of research, it, it did kind of dampen the enthusiasm. Yeah. Of I that, can understand of that. that right. Well, John, um, this has been amazing. <laughs> I'm so happy that you had time to do this today. Thank you. I have one other question, and then I, I, I actually have a couple. Um, Lori says, thank you. Uh, the information is fascinating, and we will continue to share this uh, YouTube video, and I'll send you the link, and we'll share it with our, our subscribers. But um, she also wants to know, uh, do you utilize volunteers who are not necessarily local to you? Yes, in a couple of different ways. We actually have interns that work with us and help with processing data and selecting photographs. Those generally are you know, college students or college age students doing it for credit. So that's one option. And on our website, there's a link for if you're interested in that, how to do okay. that. We do rely a lot and get help from citizen scientists, you know, both on board whale watch or naturalists on board that send us photographs, you know, in Monterey Bay, groups like the Monterey Bay Whale Watch. Yes. Uh, you know, or, you know, Peggy Stapp and her group have sent us photographs and data for decades that's been useful. And in Southern California, the Aquarium of the Pacific and the Channel Islands Naturalist Corps, you know, have all sent us again data for and photographs for decades that have played key roles in our photo ID work. So those are two ways uh, you know, that people can participate. Uh, there are also increasing efforts to record sightings of whales and get those documented both through this program, this whale alert program uh, uh, that's out there. So there are a few other ways for people to participate. Uh, 
that are great. I also urge people, you know, staying informed, uh, you know, again, our website has information. Another group I'll mention that uh, works a lot with whales, the California Ocean Alliance is a, a new group that I'm a part of based in uh, Monterey Bay that works particularly to reduce risks to whales, especially ship strike risks and their options through that. They have a whole high school student in training program. You know, that's a great way if you're a high school student, you might wanna look into their programs. That's another way for week long intensive program learning about right. whales. So, so those are a few of the opportunities that are you know, out there for people interested in participating. So I, I have one other question. Sure. You know, you always, I find, that everyone always has this one very mo incredible moment when they maybe first encountered an animal uh, or animals and they thought, oh my God, you know, you just know this is it. This is what I want to do. I love this. I mean, you don't even have to pay me. You know, I just <laughs> want to do it. What was it for you? Oh, it was a bit of an evolution because I, my main interest actually started with pollutants uh, mm -hmm. in the marine environment. And I actually uh, started studying that in the mid seventies in Puget Sound and marine mammals almost were because I was looking at the ultimate fate of pollutants that ended up in the marine environment. And I started studying seals that way and that got me into huh. marine mammals. And, and I would say, while I've had many, you know, amazing encounters with animals, my driving force always remains and what what got me hooked uh, was the opportunity to learn something new and unknown about a whale. Mm -hmm. It's that process of discovery that still in this world of you know <laughs> billions of people, you can actually go out and learn something that no one else knows and be able right. to share that. And 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 that probably is still my biggest thrill, that discovery of when you see something new or discover something new and get a chance to share it like in venues like this uh, yeah. you know, still remains the most exciting thing for me and and those encounters you know whether it's getting lifted up in the air by a humpback whale or you know some of those things that have happened in all of the time I've spent with whales uh, I still kind of go to that discovery and ability to share those discoveries as the biggest thrill. Looking like a true scientist, right? <laughs> Just the discovery of it all. Well, thank you so much. I hope we see you this summer and you can come on out and check out the new boat, All Swell. All's, well, okay, so the name of the boat is All Swell, capital A, capital S. Okay. And when we got it the week before the virus thing hit, um, we were pronouncing it All Swell. And after the virus hit, I said to Dave, I, I, I need to change the name of how we pronounce this from now on. It's going to be all's well. I am speaking into the future here. I'm just going to, it will one day all be well. Are so, you going to make the S lowercase and the W uppercase now? I, I'm thinking about that. I mean, we're working on it, you know, and Dave said, you know, the Coast Guard. And I was like, ah, whatever, you know, I can say it however I want to say it. So, um, <laughs> I'm a little bit of a rebel that way. So I, I, to me, it's all's well. So we would love to have you come on out. It goes 37 miles an hour, not knots, but 37 miles an hour. And that's in some, you know, bump, a little bit of chop. So I can't wait to try it on a day when we can really fly right. on it. Oh my goodness. It is so much fun. So look well, forward good. to I'll, I'll look forward to hearing about All that. Right. It sounds like it'll expand your area of operations then too. Yeah, I think it'll be right. We'll really be able to, to, to get out further faster, do yeah. some, and, and it's got a bathroom. Okay. So you don't have too many Zodiac style boats that actually have a true flushable toilet. And, you know, for a girl, that's a big deal. So I'm excited about that. But all right. Well, thank you, John, so, so much. So appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you soon. Nice to talk to you. All Bye. right. Take care. Bye-bye.